Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we are about to open your word, I pray that you will guide us today. As we look towards the new year, we contemplate how our lives could be different, how our actions could change, how our attitudes could be corrected. Heavenly Father, I pray today that as we read your words, you will remind us not only of the value of things changing, but the proper attitude of what should change. Heavenly Father, guide us today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn it to Ephesians chapter 5. On October 8, excuse me, on November 18th of this year, David Cassidy passed away. Now, if you had asked me who David Cassidy was in November of this year, I would have told you I'm not sure. I didn't think much, not that I didn't, he just never came to mind for me. I didn't really have any interest in him until I heard what his last words were. And then I decided to look a little bit more into the life of David Cassidy. Many of you would know David Cassidy from the Partridge family. Anybody? Okay. Anybody want to come up and sing one of his songs for us to help us all get in? No? Okay. I respect that. He, he was on the television show, The Partridge Family. He was famous for many songs. One uh, well-known was I Think I Love You as one of the songs that he was well-known for. He was adored by thousands and thousands of fans. By the time he was just 17 years old, he was known uh, throughout the nation, if not the globe. He was, as a young man, he was in Hollywood for a period of time. He was involved in the rock and roll scene. He was involved in the drug scene. And then he got signed on after a few things on stage. He got signed on to the Partridge family. Um, he became famous over those several years. By the time he was 24 years old, through his his acting on the Partridge family, through his musical career, through his concerts, he had, he had earned $8 million. There at his concerts, thousands upon thousands of young teenage girls would be there, and they would come and they would rush the stage. They would try to get to him with such fervency that they were literally crushing people up against the guardrails at the front. There are pictures of security coming and and pulling young teenage girls and carrying them away on stretchers because just the pressure of all the people thronging to the stage. When he was 24 years old at his last concert of that part of his career, it was in England, a young 14-year-old girl actually died at his concerts. One of his concerts. They don't know whether it was because of her heart condition or because she had literally been crushed under the people. For a period of time, he he. He stepped away from music later on. He got involved in acting. He was on some television shows. But because of bad investments and trusting the wrong people, uh, in his, in, uh, later on in his life, the man who had $8 million to his name had lost it. He had maybe $2,000 in his pocket and $8,000 in debt. He was living on his friend's couch. During an interview with a television show called Behind the music, he said that at his lowest point, he was crawling himself across the floor, crying out to God and saying, God, I am lost. How did it get to this? Now, a whole other sermon could be taken from those, that particular phrase. To talk about turning to God and relying upon him, David uh, turned to analysis and tried to figure out what was going on in his life. He later rebuilt his career. He became involved with a show in Las Vegas, and he is still well-known throughout the world. His friend said, Danny Bonaducci said of him, that David Cassidy had made, become famous not once, not twice, but three times he went from nothing to success. He said, let's have any of us try that once and see if we could succeed. 
But he said three times he was able to do this. Near the end of his life, he revealed that he had been suffering from dementia. And in November, he died of liver fa- of kidney failure. His daughter, Katie, said that his last words, this man who had thrice reinvented himself, had seen throngs of people rush to the stage to try to, to just be near him. An actor, a singer, a performer, a producer, a writer. His final words on his deathbed were, so much wasted time. And that's what made me want to investigate who he was. For your final words to reflect upon your life, to see the scope of everything that you had done, and to say, so much wasted time. That is not the kind of lives that we are to live. We all have a certain number of days in front of us. God has ordered our days and knows our length of time on this globe. We do not. But many of us, if I were to ask you right now, how did 2017 go for you? If you look back on 2017, would you say that this year you used your time wisely would you say that you invested not financially but through efforts through intention in the right way or would you be able to look back and say yeah I wasted a lot of time myself do we live in a world of busyness if I were to say were any of you lazy in 2017 some, some might be willing to, oh, maybe. But most of no, I was busy. I was doing stuff. I was active. I was doing this, and I was doing this, and I was actively doing that. But did those things that you were active in actually accomplish anything of any value? We've developed some words in, in recent years of things that we can spend our time doing. One is called binge-watching. With the development of streaming television, we can go online and we can get Netflix or we can get Hulu or we can get Amazon or we can get other streaming services and we can sit down and we can actually watch an entire season of a show. Anybody been to watch anything you're willing to confess this morning? It's a day of confession. Let us repent. You can sit down. We have the ability to sit down and not just a season. If it's an old show, we can watch the entire span of the show. And it's called binge watching. And we can do that. And some people watch it and they're proud of it. They're, yeah, I just watched the whole series of such and such and such. When we get to heaven and we stand before the pearly gates and God says to us, or looks at us, are we going to say to God, God, I watched all of 24 in two days. All right. I've watched Star Trek three times. We can move on from entertainment to other things that take our time. Busyness, little things. It could be at work. It could be here at church. Busyness, busyness, spinning those wheels. But are we making any real difference? Ephesians 5, and let's begin in verse, let's begin in verse 15. says, look carefully, then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. Some of your scriptures say redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 15 encourages us to walk carefully, not unwise, but wise. Where does our wisdom come? Where does our understanding of our world come from? It comes from the word of God. If you want to know what it is like, to walk wisely, invest in scripture reading. And that could be part of your New Year's resolutions. We sometimes balk at resolutions because we go through January and we're doing them, then February hits and we're off of them. Some people have given up making resolutions. I get all that. But here's an opportunity for us to say, what is important? What 
what is important to our lives, if we're going to walk wisely, then we should be reading the words of the most wise person ever. How many of you last year could raise your hand and say, you know what, Matthew, I heard the confession for you. I just read too much Bible. I just spent too much time in God's Word. I'm going to use an illustration of the potential for that. Katie's sister, um, you don't tell her I told this story. Um, she used to, her, bed, her parents would tell her it was time for bed, let's say at 10 o'clock, and they'd come in her room at 10.15, and they'd say, your lights are still on, and she would say, yeah, I'm reading the Bible. Oh, there's a conflicted parent, isn't it? But, but, but you, 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 you know, what comes first, obedience or, or reading the word? But most of us, that's not our problem. Our problem is that we don't spend nearly enough time investing in God's word. And that's where we walk wisely from. But I want to spend a little more time. That's the one we should all be doing. And you say, Matthew, preachers, preachers talk about that all the time. Here's the thing. If all of our congregation and all of our people were fluent in God's word, then we, could, we, we wouldn't press it all the time. And I've got a feeling that there's plenty of people, even in this room, who read your Bible on, on not a regular basis. I've not done a polling of it, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But understanding God's Word is vital. Parents, we should be instilling it in our children. I'll come back to that thought in a moment. But, but what is more valuable than walking in wisdom? He says, walk in wisdom, or look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. I said a moment ago that we spend our times being busy, but are we making the best use of our time? If God, right here in Scripture, said to you, walk wisely and make the best use of your time, because the days are evil. How would we begin to, to restructure our days so that we're actually making the most of our time? In our world today, in our society, there's something that we've come up with called the 80-20 principle. And I think it rings true, and I think, I think we can apply it. Who's familiar with the 80-20 principle? It, it appears in several different, several different ways. Sometimes you might say that, that let's talk about a congregation, that, 80, that 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the work. And we can sometimes see that. There are, sometimes there's a small group of people who do most of the different ministry. Other people said that in an organization or with your customers, that 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the complaining. Now, if you have 20% of the people doing the work and 20% of the people doing the complaining, as long as that's not the same 20 percent, you're doing OK. If that becomes the same 20%, you got problems. But if we were to say that 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work, in a church, we might want to encourage everyone to spread out those responsibilities. But it also means that for a church, only 20% of what we do as a church actually produces any benefit, any growth, any diving deeper into God's Word. So we can ask ourselves, what are the things that we actually need to focus upon? What are the things that we actually need to be investing our time and our resources and our energy in doing for the health and life and ministries of this church? And let's give less attention to those 80% of the things that don't really matter. How about in your own lives? I talked about parents and children a moment ago and God's Word. Just this morning, um, during, during the morning, I was refreshing a little bit on the 80-20 principle, and Katie came to the, to the to the kitchen and said, do we have to listen to this? I said, I said, no. So I turned it off. And then she put on her own thing program and started listening to it. I said, oh, okay. You get to put on your own program. Oh, I see how it is. Her program was on teaching children a biblical worldview. And one thing he said in there is that parents, we should be teaching our children the basic story of the Bible from Adam to Jesus to the, his return. From the beginning to the end, what is the scope of of scripture what is that huge narrative that God is telling and then he said we spend a lot of time on things like feeding the poor and social justice and the social gospel that we haven't taught our children how to even understand God's word and I paused and I said Katie that was the 80-20 principle and she looked at me and said well you just have 
And he said, we spend a lot of time doing all these other things with our children, but we aren't even teaching them the basics of understanding God's word. Parents, do you want your children to be biblically literate? Do you want your children to understand the scope of what God has done in creation and what God is continuing to do? Then you need to be teaching them those basic understandings of the story. Now, for many of us, even as adults, we don't understand the basic flow of the story. So our children's competency is, is being hurt because we haven't taken the time to invest in understanding the scope of the gospel. Or, or, excuse me, or the whole biblical story. Many of you have jobs where you are not the one that sets the agenda. Many of you, you go to work, someone else tells you how you are going to order your day. But some of you have jobs where you get to determine how you're going to order your day. Are you going to do the things that are going to produce the greatest amount of, of value, if you will, for your time? Me as a pastor, I can come to this office and I can get involved. I can stay busy all day. I can read commentaries and I can go around this church and I can see something that's out of order and I can try to fix it and I can go over to the education building and I can look at the different resources and I can, I can call people and see how people are doing, which is an important part of what I do. And that I can do all these different things and I can get home at the end of the day and I can say, what have I accomplished today? Can I be busy? Yes. Can I be doing things that are going to invest in all of you? Can I be spending time actually finding out what's going on in your lives and trying to minister to you? There's a very big difference between being busy and being productive. And God calls us to redeem the time. Make the most of what you have been given. And many of us are too caught up in, in the busy work to ever take time to focus on what is actually important. Important in our marriages, important with our lives of our children, important in the lives of our church, and important in our own relationship to God. This year, rather than creating a, a to-do list, ask yourself, what are the one or two things that I could spend this year investing my time in and actually dive in to doing them? For some of you, to, in order to accomplish that, you're going to have to reevaluate your total day. You're going to have to ask yourself, when should you go to bed and when should you get up? There was a preacher, I think it was John Wesley, who did an entire sermon on this passage that said what we really need to do is ask ourselves, how much time are we sleeping? And he wasn't saying you need to sleep less. He was saying we should sleep more because our bodies need rest. I can't imagine preaching a whole sermon on sleep, but, but he was able to do it. We need to ask ourselves, do we need to get up a little earlier so that we can take care of our devotional time and our time with God so that we can face the day walking in wisdom rather than walking in and allowing whatever the world throws at us to control us. And then he says this phrase, because the days are evil. Such a, such a strange turn of phrase. What does it mean to say the days are evil? It could be simply a dramatic um, flair to saying that if you don't control the days, the days will control you. Or if you waste time during the day, you're going to see that you've not really produced anything. Or it could mean that the culture in which this was written, the very look and scope of what was going around you was anti-God, so you needed to make sure that what you were doing with your life was trying to turn it towards God. I think we can see that in our own culture. There's plenty in our day that wants to take us away from God. There's plenty of influences, plenty of intentions, plenty of availabilities that would take us far from doing what God would have us do. And so what this Ephesians is saying is pay attention to what you're investing your time in. And ask yourself, is this really valuable? Maybe those shows you're binge watching need to stop. Maybe those people you're hanging out with who are trying to get you drunk all the time, you need to stop hanging out with them. Maybe the, maybe the 
the activity that you so love, that hobby, is tearing time away from your wife or your husband or your children, and you need to let that go. So for some of us, it's not just a reorganization of when we do things. For some of us, there are things that we just need to get rid of because they have no value. Or maybe you could spend a little bit of time on that hobby, but don't let it take over your life. Because when it is taking over your life, it is just pulling you away from God. And you need to be more focused. You need to be walking wise. And you need to be redeeming your time because there's an evil out there that's trying to pull you away from what God would have you do. And then he says in verse 17, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. These two little two little verses. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here's where the church, here's where Christians should take a different perspective on something like the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule is used by businesses, it's used by companies, it's used by entrepreneurs, it's used by leaders to try and make money or have influence. For the church, we've got to take something like that, anything we're talking about, and we've got to say, how do I take this and how do I see what the Lord of the, w- the will of the Lord is to see what it is that I should be valuing and what should be important in my life? See, we can take any leadership principle, but if it takes us in a direction that is not what God would have for us, it may look successful in the world's eyes, but when we stand before God, we're going to have to have to ask them, answer the same questions about wasting our time. What does God see as valuable for your life? I asked you a moment ago, parents, do you think that having a biblical worldview or having a a literate understanding of the Bible is important for your children. There may be some of you in this room today that said, you know what, I've never really cared if my children fully understood the Bible. I've never really seen it as valuable. I bring them to church on Sunday morning. Isn't that enough? Some of you may have said, I don't really care if my children know God's word as much as I care that they get into a good college. I need them to study hard in school. And if they don't have time to read God's word, so be it. They can make that up down the road. I don't have time to invest in my children's spiritual life because I'm too busy taking care of making sure that they get from A to B on time. Some parents don't care if their children have a biblical worldview or a biblical understanding. But God does. God tells us way back in Deuteronomy, Parents are to instruct their children when they rise up and when they lay down and when they walk along the path. See, I could say to you that, uh, that walking in God's word is important, but some of you might say, I don't really think that having a devotional life and a prayer life is that important. God does. When the disciples were first beginning to start the church, and, and, and the apostles, excuse me, when the apostles were beginning to set up the church, They saw all these people coming and trying to, to, they had so many needs. And the disciples said, the apostles said, we need to raise up some men who can take care of the needs of the people so that we have time to, to, to study God's word, to present God's word, and to pray. The apostles saw prayer and Bible study and proclaiming God's word so important that they had to bring up other men who could take care of those additional things. Studying God's word and prayer was primary for the apostles who walked with Christ. Do we think that those things are not important for us? You may not be in control at your job of how you spend your time. But you can be in control about how you treat people while you're there. If you continue to look at Ephesians, it's dealing with relationships from this point on. It's dealing with children and parents, husbands and wives, slaves and masters, and spirituality. 
and we would translate, we would take slaves and masters and put that right into the perspective of, of employee and, and, and employer, not the same dynamic, but the same principles. So after he says, walk wise, don't be foolish, find out what the will of the Lord is, he starts talking about marriage relationships and parent relationships and job relationships. How we order our day and then how we treat people during that day are vitally important to God. Is it important to you that you do that in a way that brings God glory? A lot of us next tomorrow, maybe today you've done it, maybe you haven't, but we're going to wake up tomorrow morning and we're going to say, well, it's 2018. How am I going to be different today? Before you decide how you're going to be different, I want to encourage you tonight before you go to bed or tomorrow morning when you get up, say, Lord, what is your will for my life? And here's the thing. This verse says in verse chapter 17, it says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That means that there is in some way, shape, or fashion the ability for us to recognize and realize what the will of the Lord is. Oh, it's a mystery. Oh, I'll never understand what God's will is for us. Oh, he keeps it shrouded and such. It's so hard to understand and discern what the will of the Lord is. For some of you, it might be shrouded. For some of you, there might be a sin in your life that until you let go of that sin... God's not going to reveal it to you. But for some of us, it's not, so, it's not so, so mysterious. It's laid in front of us in black and white, and we've just rejected it. Spend time talking to God. Say, God, what would you have me do this year? What is your will for my life this year? Show that to me, Lord. And when you have an understanding of what it is, it is something that's going to honor God. It's something that is going to bring value to your life and to the lives of the people around you. It is something that's going to elevate him and elevate your relationship with him. Then spend your time and attention and focus on that next year. Church leaders, chairman of ministries, what is God's will for your ministry this coming year at this church. At this meeting in January, I want to add something to your responsibility list. Not only do I expect you to vote and get a new chair for your different teams and your different ministries, I expect you to pray about that ministry. I expect you to pray about how God is going to use that ministry this next year. And how are you going to invest real time into that, not on the superfluous things, not on the 80% that's not going to do anything, but how are we going to dive in and do the important things of what God calls us to do? This year, let these verses ring true to us. Let us this year, this coming year, look carefully then how we walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, let us not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So when we look back upon our days, when we look back upon our year, when we look back upon our ministries, when we look back upon our families and our jobs and our, and our lives, we don't look back and say, so much wasted time. We contemplate when we get to heaven, when we hear our Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are busy people with busy lives going so many different directions. God, I ask you today, as we stand looking towards a new year, that we would be careful and attentive to how we walk. Not just reacting to everything around us, but trying to focus in on what is important 
and that we would do things that matter. We would do things that matter to you. And that I pray that we would become in tune to your will. So that our efforts would not be in vain. They would be beneficial as you have called us to serve you. Reveal to us and let us spend time doing your will. Let this not be a year of waste. Let this be a year of following our Savior. In Jesus' name, As we sing this next song and as the ushers come down, or excuse me, the deacons who are prepared to deliver the Lord's Supper, I pray that not only as you take these elements of the Lord's Supper, not only do I ask you to reflect upon your relationship with God in, in relationship to your sins. You know, oftentimes we talk about the Lord's Supper as an opportunity to reflect upon the sins and seek forgiveness for those things and, and then have a moment of recommitment to Christ before you take these elements I want to ask you that as we sing these songs and as you hold the elements, as you wait for the others to get them, I want to ask you to, to think about this past year, about the things that, that God was showing you last year, this year, and how you might take those lessons next year. I want to ask this not only as a time of, of forgiveness of sin, but use this as an opportunity to make a commitment to look at your world through your relationship with Christ and see how you can take those things in your life and redeem the time and walk wisely in the will of the Lord.